go. Yeah, I, I just came to deliver the water. Here, I, I um, got one. Yeah. No, we're good. Just in case. There. Yeah, just in case. You guys were here before me, but welcome to wow. the Walter Reed Theater for this very special conversation. This is something that I've been excited about for. We're honoring you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I thought that the best place to begin would be at the very beginning of when you both were, became conscious of the art of cinematography and aspired to become a, a cinematographer. Of, of what it was, I would imagine when you're a child, when you're watching movies, you're not quite conscious of how movies are made. You receive them in a, um, in a different way. So at what point did you become conscious of the art of cinematography? Uh, Charlie Chaplin for me. Mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, my father was a projectionist at the major company in Italy, Luxfilm. Mm -hmm. And one day, I mean, I was probably seven years old mm -hmm. with my brothers and my sister. We saw him coming with a little piece of machinery that probably was left over mm -hmm. from the company. Mm -hmm. And with some kind of roll of film. And I asked to myself and my brother in the little courtyard mm -hmm to paint in white the, 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 the back wall, mm -hmm. and we played, we just mm, destroyed everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the end of the day, when the moon rise, mm -hmm. we have a over little chair, mm -hmm. and we had, for the first time, we saw the pieces of city light. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was enchanted that so much, that that stay in my memory all the time, mm -hmm. till when I grow up, and I start to study photography, cinematography, and. Uh, I became the living dream of my father. Mm -hmm. My father was screen films, so he was trying, of course, to be part of the kind of images. Mm. He put his uh, dream on my shoulder, and, uh, and, I, and I really started to really feel that that dream uh, can be mine. And I had the chance to study for nine years photography and cinematography. Mm -hmm. I went to school at the most incredible school in Europe at that time, Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia, mm -hmm. which was the Italian film school. And the uh, teacher of history of cinema was screening most of, of the movie of Saga Berlin, uh, the film of, of, of Renoir, of the, uh, Garbo and so on. But I was always looking for the film of Charlie Chaplin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, I was not <laughs> having that. But I was very young. I was 18 years old. Mm. Ed, how about you? Well, strangely enough, uh, my father owned a movie theater, and he imported uh, our carbons light that projected on the screen and yeah. were used in lights. And so I didn't take cinema very seriously. I used to go to the, the theater with him, and I used to put popcorn in the bags. And so I didn't take it very seriously. And then I was in art school at uh, Harvard, and. Uh, we took this gut course, you know, this so-called easy course in film appreciation, and uh, Gideon Bachman taught it. And uh, it was uh, Italian neorealism. And I saw this film by uh, De Sica, Umberto D. And the idea that he constructed images to tell a story almost without words about this pensioner and. He lost his uh, boarding house, and it so touched me how it was photographed with the, the, and the idea that you could pick up a camera and tell a story with images, and that, that's really what excited me about what cinema could be. It, it's interesting. I remember Orson Welles uh, saying that he admired uh, De Sica's shoeshine so much because he felt like the camera disappeared, which is an interesting comment um, and kind of... It seems um, odd to reflect on it that way now. Um, I <coughs> asked Ed and Vittorio to choose clips from films that were formative for them, and it's interesting because Ed chose an Italian film <laughs> and Vittorio chose an American film. Um, <laughs> and um, <coughs> I thought it would be good to start with, with your choice, Vittorio. Did you want to say anything before we run those clips? Better that we see first the clips. Okay, let's look at the clips from Citizen Kane. Mm. <coughs> well, <coughs> it was Bernardo Bertolucci, just before the beginning of shooting of The Conformist, uh, they screened uh, Citizen Kane to myself, Ferdinando Scarfiotti, the production designer, and Gide Magrini, the costume designer. The reason was only <coughs> one, very clear. He uh, said, Vittorio Nando Gitt, I want to show to you something that's very intriguing. 
the kind of hyperrealism, the kind of surrealism there is uh, in this kind of movie. This is the kind of probably uh, a journey that we have to mm, take in, in, a, in front of us. Surrealism has three main elements to lead uh, the entire human being. Love, which is the center of the life of human being. Dreams, which is the chance to go beyond the rationalities. And liberation, to be not tied to standard regulation. Honestly, it was great, the great impact of, of Citizen Kane to me was not the chance to learn something new from Greg Toll and Orson Welles. Somehow I felt that they gave me some confirmation or some kind of intuition that I had since ever, but not necessarily everybody was, on, I was trying to able to present to everybody in the proper form or, to, or they to understand. Bernardo had those kind of idea. And I remember that uh, uh, the chance that we can have uh, later on in, in, in expressing ourselves uh, came from those kind of principles. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, all the school that we did in Italy, but also I think all around the world, in the fi uh, we said late 50, early 60, um, was mainly black and white. So practically, uh, we were educated in two, two different forms. Those two sequences, uh, the search for the memory, uh, the, and try to investigate into the uh, uh, small life of the little child, uh, practically was done uh, visually into a screening room full of smoke where you cannot see people, you see just shadows of people. You don't see them in, in the face, they are symbols. They can be completely in silhouette against the white screen. Pratty, they make a, a very specific symbology between past and darkness. The other sequence, uh, when Keynes in the political convention show himself completely in light, show himself in the huge uh, image uh, that, uh, that is filled the entire uh, wall over there, Pratty, because he wants to be present, uh, uh, very clear in front to everybody, give me the other uh, side the future of this kind of man, and only the past, which is, was completely in light. Mainly my, my life it was started to, in the way that I was thinking, the relationship between these two elements, light and darkness. I was lucky enough that uh, um, after several proposals, which I refused uh, to become cinematographer, even uh, mm, because I become very young, camera operator at 21 years old, but uh, I thought that I was not ready myself, there was mm, a lot, a lot investigated between uh, the composition of the image and the movement, the rhythm of the image. They thought, oh, I don't want to be in, uh, myself already dealing with the relationship between light and shadows in, uh, in, in cinematography at that time. Also because uh, not necessarily I think that we can do every movie that we propose to us with any director, with any story. Uh, I felt uh, that there is some kind of feeling, uh, a kind of uh, magnetic relationship with the director. So I always refused, till one time, 1968, I was 28 years old. The Franco Rossi, a very good gentleman, a very good director in Italy, um, doing the yachtful, yachtful, in black and white. And uh, meeting with him, uh, to me, was a chance to see that uh, I can be ready to start to perform in this kind of art, this kind of ability in, in, in dealing between light and shadows with him, next to him. It became for me like a, a new father figure in the way. And I was glad that it was, the movie was in black and white. But uh, uh, the story was uh, a dual between two different generations, father and son. In the moment, the, the fascist time in, in, in Italy was changing uh, in, in, close, in closing one, mostly one important chapter. And uh, I remember that I was using all my instinct, uh, uh, all my knowledge in technology, because that's what they told me. They, was, they teach me in school. They teach me mostly in, in, in technology. I felt that they, I know very well how to use camera, film, uh, uh, filter, lighting, whatever. But uh, somehow I remember that any time that I was taking one decision was by instinct. 
I didn't know why I was dealing with natural energy and artificial energy in relation to the two of them. And also I remember that when the movie was almost over, I cried because uh, for me it was like my first love, the first chance that I had the, ch to, uh, the possibility to express myself completely in a, com in a complete form in cinematography, in a complete uh, story. It was coming from a book, the, the title. And a friend of mine told me, Vittorio, why? And I said, well, probably I will do another film, bigger or, or, or smaller, uh, better or worse, but I will never be the, the first anymore. It's something that I am losing my innocence at this time. And he said to me, this is life, Vittorio. You have to face consciousness from now on. Later, not too later, uh, with Bernardo, we start our journey. Very soon. No, Ed, <coughs> you yeah. mentioned neorealism before, but you chose a clip from a well, different kind of Well, part of the course was dealing with the Italian cinema, and growing out of the neorealism were Antonioni and Fellini. And this clip I picked was something that was almost like a silent film, the way he created, it, it was part of a, a clip in the beginning of the film. And I was so taken with, again, how the language of the camera, because for me, the language of cinema are images, not words, and that he created this subjectivity with the camera in such a simple and poetic way that I was very moved by it, and I realized that the power of the image could tell these stories. And so, you know, uh, Tonioni dealt with this kind of ennui, metaphysical questions about these characters, and, I, and this scene, you, you could even see just these few shots, and you understand the tension between uh, Monica Vitti and she's breaking up with her boyfriend, so. And, and just to, Say it. Antonioni was a graduate of the Centro Sperimentale. No, he went there in the in the forties. No, Michelangelo Antonioni went to this went to the same school that you went to. The Antonioni went to the Centro Sperimentale yes. in the forties. Yes. So let's look at the clip from Eclipse. Um. What was it about that particular clip uh, as opposed to there's so many sequences? Well, in that whole that sequence and then at the end of the film that he doesn't communicate anything with words, that yeah. through the images we understand everything that's happening in that relationship. Yes. And yeah. that was an early great Italian cinematographer, Gian Gianni Di, Ven Gian Di Venenza. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who went on and shot for Fellini, Eight and a Half, and other films. Mm -hmm. And did you go on to, did you get more and more involved in Antonioni's cinema and Fellini's Yeah, then, then I, I, the whole, you know, it's whenever you, where you grow up, at what age, you know, and the Italian cinema at that time was at its apex, really, you know, Fellini and De Sica and Visconti, and yeah. so I, I immersed myself in that, those images and those, you know, photographers. When did you make your first foray into cinematography? Well, I, I told this story in an interview. Um, strangely enough, I did my thesis on uh, Prima della Revolution, uh, on a, the, before the revolution, Bertolucci's second film, that Victoria was the camera assistant on. So we, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Bertolucci came to New York to the New York Film Festival, and in this room I saw the Spider Stratagem. Not this room. Not this Alice room. This room wasn't built. Oh, yet. all right, yeah. Alice. Uh, Tully Alice Tully Hall. Hall. And I met Bernardo, and he didn't speak English, but I spoke to him all the lines of before the Revolution. I told him <laughs> my shoes were from Parma too. So he looked at me like I was crazy, <laughs> and he said, "You're my first American fan." So, and that night he invited me to sit in his box to see Il Conformist. Mm -hmm. So, I'm also Victoria Storaro's first American fan, because I nearly <laughs> fell out of the box, and then I had the great fortune to be on the set of La Luna, um, 
to help out because of union issues that Victoria wasn't in the union, so I was a standby DP. And then years later, I was on the set of One from the Heart with Godard while he was shooting, and so we've known each other for over 40 years. So mm -hmm. I, I did want to say this about Victoria. He has done more in the last 50 years for the recognition and esteem that cinematography is than anybody. So thank you, Victoria. Um, that, that's a good segue to the, to, to the conformist. And it, it's, I just wanted, to, before we look at it, Vittorio, or maybe I, I just wanted to say, you mentioned that Bertolucci had screened Citizen Kane for you and Fernando Scarfiotti and for the costume designer. And it's interesting in Citizen Kane and in the clips we're about to see, particularly the first one from the conformist, every single element, all of those elements are woven together in a seamlessly. Um, so let's look at those uh, clips from The Conformist. I, I need to do a little step back in order to mm, bring back to in my memory in front of you this new duality of this movie. When I finish uh, Giovinezza, Giovinezza, Yachtful, Yachtful, uh, and I realized that uh, I was very concerned and happy that all the technology that I knew that I can do a movie as a, at that time called a director of photography, I felt uh, somehow that was, I was lacking something. I didn't know what. Till one day, and I went with my, my wife in, uh, in Roma, and we enter into a little church called San Luigi dei Francesi. Uh, sometimes we were going to church, uh, not only for religious purpose, sometimes just because uh, admiring the style of the architecture, uh, because usually, in, uh, particularly in Italy, there is so many news in every church. There are statues, there are paintings, sometimes, if you like, there is also music from the organ. At that day, there was an incredible silence into this little church. And I saw a few people uh, in the, in the, on the left side of the church looking up. And I don't know why, step by step, they approach. Suddenly, I saw these images. The image of Michelangelo Merisi called the Caravaggio. They, were, they painted the calling of San Matthew. And I was shocked about this image because I realized that uh, how ignorant I was, uh, even if in my nine years of studying photography and cinematography, seven years of camera operator, nobody told me about this genius. They just one line, just marked one line of uh, sunlight into darkness, creating uh, a, an incredible uh, uh, sentence for all of us. An immortality way to say this is uh, the difference of the separation between humanity or divinity between past and future, between unconscious and consciousness, between light and shadows. Well, those kind of separation was intriguing me that probably all my work was influenced by this painting, even when I, when I was not thinking. Honestly, uh, in relation to the first sequence that we just saw, the, the famous sequence with the strip of light and shadows, I, between uh, Spider Stratagem, the first film I did as a cinematographer with Bernardo, I did the, the Bird of the Crystal Plumage with Dario Argento, so I couldn't prepare the conformist, practically. I arrived at the last moment. Bernardo took me in this uh, apartment in Rome. We were alone, myself and him, Saturday morning. And next, mo next Monday we were supposed to start filming. And I have to say, not even the movie was ready to prepare because uh, Almost every day we were going with Ferdinando Scarfiotti and Bernardo, lunchtime or at the end of the day, to see some location all around the area of the Eur, the rationalism architecture that was in Rome. And right away when I saw this Venetian blind on this, uh, I immediately I had the idea to make the, the, the sequence with the strip of light and shadows. I have to be honest, I never have in my mind the, the image of Caravaggio. 
the, the separation between like the shadows they did in the, the movie, in that uh, painting. But it came to me spontaneously. Uh, Susie, don't be shocked. When I saw Stefania Sandrelli dressed by uh, Jit Magrini in strip white and black, I was so happy, so surprised because I didn't know. No, nobody, Bernardo didn't say to me in the way they was dressed. So my idea of lighting was the idea that G at G Jit Magrini at that moment. So the chance that uh, we can get together was uh, really by instinct, by emotion for my side. Only later, I met uh, Alfred Stiglitz, uh, much later on. Uh, the, he did, the, in 1889, uh, a photograph in North Italy, exactly photographing the, the separation between light and shadows and these images. I didn't know at that time. But one thing that uh, shocked me a few years later, in watching an uh, old photograph, this is a photographer a photograph that uh, I took, 1959. I was in Centro Sperimentale in school, the second year, and um, I was doing a short film from a, a young director, and uh, we had at that time, um, full time, a group of electrician, or group, a group working for us as a student, and they prepare all the lights on top to the, what we call bridge, on top of the set, and I said, no, I think that I don't, want to, I don't want to follow what the teacher told us. Please bring an arc, an arc put behind the, 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 the Venetian blind. And that's it. I need after only one piece of a, a white uh, um, muslin just to reflect in, on his face. And that's it. This young man over here is Marco Bellocchio, one of the... Uh, new um, di director that came also for the Centro Sperimentale. There was uh, an actor first in one year, I have to do two years as a, as a director. I forgot in my memory that I did this image in 1959, in 59, when in 1970 I did The Conformist. I think that uh, the chance for me to make this separation between light and shadows was a uh, try to express in the separation that was between uh, the real life and the representation of the fascism at that time, uh, what Bernardo was searching for, and, uh, and the chance that we can have also to represent the personality of Marcello Clerici, the leading character. He discovered when he was 12 years old uh, that he was different. He didn't know at that time that, uh, exactly why he was different. He thought he was, uh, they killed somebody. The reality was that he was felt different inside himself because he discovered some kind of homosexuality they have in him. And he tried all his best to be even to everybody, to be conformist. To do, everybody's fascist, also he was fascist as well, and so on. So practically, he was hiding into himself his own real nature. So the chance to have separated light and shadows was exactly the symbolic element the, between myself and Bernardo, we were working together because he's always, in every movie, he was expressing every scene in the way he was writing, the way he was directing, the way he was uh, put the camera in, in the proper conscious way, but not completely. Some part was suggested, some part was symbolic, some part was either in shadows. But when we, in the second part of the film, we arrived in the sequence where you just saw over there, in France. We knew, when we spoke, that we have to make reuniting these two elements. Paris at that time was the, was represented the city of freedom. Anybody that was from Spain or Italy under dictatorship, they want to really think in a different way, they left Italy or, or Madrid, they went to France. So for, for us, this did not be a separate any longer like the shadow, could be united. Leonardo da Vinci said once, uh, the marriage between light and shadows creating children, creating colors. I didn't know at that time the meaning of the color. I didn't know why those kind of blue came in my mind. I didn't know the representation, the symbology that those colors had. I had those kind of feeling. Because probably it was the end of the year, 
in, in North Europe, most of the time was cloudy. I felt the difference between the natural energy, particularly in the afternoon, and artificial energy creating those kind of atmosphere. And I say, Bernardo, I would like to do the entire segment in Paris in this color. In, this, in order to, to make a symbol of this city, to make a symbol of why they came over here, all those people, why they're thinking a lot different. Not just one or two shots at, at the end of the day, a magic hour. Have to be completely the magic hour, Paris. And Bernardo said, Vittorio, I like the idea. Do it if you can. But we have two weeks to shoot over here after there is Christmas time to back in Italy. And we, and we have to film it from nine or to eight o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the afternoon. I was very happy and lucky to have a very bad winter, very dark. So I have a, a very long magic hour in order to do that. But uh, we never express ourselves in completely one way. Even in France, when they were talking about uh, the politics in Rome, like for example the sequence that I couldn't show here because there were too many, the famous Plato myth of the cave, we went back to the kind of separation between light and shadows. To have went back to almost performing almost a desaturated color, almost in black and white. You maybe remember the myth of Plato because it's something that interests us as a filmmaker as well. Bernardo wants to do it because he wants to prove the relationship with the fascist person. Plato said that there are an enormous amount of people being chained since ever, since they were born, into a cave, and they were up to watch uh, at the end of the cave, and they see what a fire behind them at the end of the cave was interrupted by people passing by with statues and, and, and the flags, creating shadows. The prison of Plato were looking at moving shadows on, on the back wall, created that that was reality. Only when the philosopher take the decision to understand what was re reality, what was, uh, what was interpretation, what was a different uh, fantasy, uh, was able to unchain himself and uh, went outside and discovered what reality was, uh, practically he said very clear that that was uh, an image of reality. If you think it for a moment, uh, is a perfect metaphor, apart from the fascist period, but for cinema. The prison of Plato is you, me, when we are spectators, and we are watching into this cave, which is the theater, in, in the back wall, image movie created by the projector instead of the fire, the sensor of the film moving. Cinema has nothing to do with reality. When they say we're doing cinema verite, real cinema, it's not true. Cinema is an interpretation of reality. We can be believable for real element, but it's over interpretation. And that's fantastic, uh, this kind of, of concept. And I think that uh, probably this sequence, uh, Ciao, Sofia, I love you. Probably touched Francis Coppola when saw the conformist here at the New York Film Festival. It was so in love with the conformist that he bought a 60 millimeter print, and he told me that any time he was uh, feeling the press, he was cleaning the conformist, having a good time. He loved so much. He knew better the conformist than me. And from that film, he called me to do Apocalypse Now, and probably, probably the sequence of cards coming from uh, that sequence, in my mind, coming from Caravaggio. Even if I don't remember at all, <laughs> consciously, the when we were there with Francis deciding to make the of cards a representational symbol through the fact that they don't have to show himself from the beginning, but only in pieces, all like a mosaic, only at the last moment he presents his face of the horror of the world. That probably was uh, coming unconsciously from those kind of sequence. That's what I think. My non-knowledge of art the Caravaggio teach me, the Plato teach me, the Mozart teach me later, practically give me the chance that, uh, for me to stop after Apocalypse Now for one year, don't do any other movie, and start to again to be that great moment that I had in the school, be a student. I 
pull up all the se several uh, books, searching some more, and I start the symbology, physiology, dramaturgy of color. And that's another chapter of my life, open after that, when I met you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Ed, the kind of relationship that, that Vittorio is talking about that he had with Bertolucci, you've had that kind of relationship with Todd Haynes, I think. Um, how many films have you made together? The, uh, five or six. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, what uh, Victoria touched on is, is so essential to what images are because it's very hard to explain mm -hmm. uh, yeah. what, what we do. Yes. But uh, for me, they're either a psychological or a uh, poetic way of expressing what the illusion we're creating as our images express. They're the subtext for the story. They're um, ways of understanding what the story is. Like mm -hmm. I said, the language for, you know, why? Why is films different than theater? It seems like an obvious question. Or uh, literature, it's, what, what, the, it's the means of using the images. And for me, images are almost like music. They're a, a non-verbal way of communicating emotions. And that, that's what we're involved in. And it's an intuitive process that Victoria is talking about, but it's also, a certain educational process of how you approach those images to tell your story. And every film has a different methodology, a different way of approaching a story. Like later I'll show a clip from Wonderstruck, and actually the writer is here, Brian Seldnick, and but he wrote into the book that we adapted, he adapted as a script, these, uh, what, what deafness is, and so what beautiful metaphor, but using the silent period and using this girl in 1927 to mirror the, what deafness is, and we shoot the film like almost a silent film, but also in the 70s of a young boy who becomes deaf. Mm -hmm. So those are the clues, we're all looking for those clues to translate the story because photography isn't, for me, a representational media, but a psychological. Hmm. So you chose a couple of clips from earlier work, and those are, these are clips yeah, I, from... Yeah, I think, if I remember, I did a clip from Far From, Far Heaven. from Heaven, which is kind of a, a reference to Douglas Sirk and All That Heaven Allows. But again, images aren't just for there, the, oh, it's cool to shoot in the 50s. Douglas Sirk was using this, these kind of images, these mannered, expressionistic images, as a form of repression of middle class values. He was actually using it as a social critique. He came out of Brechtian theater in Germany and emigrated to the United States very late. And uh, he got to, in the film industry, doing the, what they considered weepies, or they were like soap operas, we would consider but he imbued him with social and political commentaries about American life. Mm. And so actually the, the beauty is a form of repression. Mm. So but I showed a clip of that and then a clip of the Dylan film because there. what was interesting for me about the Dylan film, again, Todd Haynes used cinematic language to tell a story about not one Dylan, but six Dylans because Dylan always reinvented himself as an artist eschewing his music and to move on. And so what better way to do that but to show 60s and 70s cinematic language because in a way, Dylan was like an actor reinventing himself. So he did that through the anti-hero Western of the 70s, you know, like Peck and Paul, Altman, and then uh, Pat Barrett and Billy the Kid, that's the Richard Gere character. And then we did uh, early, you know, eight and a half Fellini when um, Kate Blanchett plays when he goes electric. And then there's a Godardian section with Heath Ledger. So we used all these different textures to create this format for the storyline. So we'll just look at a couple. Yeah, pieces. let's look at those clips from Far From Heaven and I'm Not There.
That's a pretty striking contrast between the two different kinds of movies <laughs> <laughs> that you chose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to show different clips. Yeah, and it's also interesting because the color values in the clip from The Conformist and then Far From Heaven, or mm. the clip from Far From Heaven are not dissimilar but to different ends. Well, I, I think also Victorio, you know, we don't look at color as a pictorial but as a psychological tool. I mean, painters since the 19th century have experimented with what color means psychologically in the viewer and so that's what I've always tried to approach color that way. Not just as a decorative means, but to understand psychologically how it can affect the viewer. And you're working closely with the production designer and the costume yeah, designer. Yeah, with the production designer, the yeah. wardrobe. You know, I'm, I'm very involved early on shooting tests, being in the art departments, my favorite department, mm. because it's what you put in front of the camera that you know, is you receive on, on the film or on the digital media. And, it's, and there's a difference even on the digital media and the film, I found out that certain way color responds is different digitally than film, so I had to learn how to manipulate the color digitally mm -hmm. so it looked the way I thought it should look. Mm -hmm. Vittorio, you've been working digitally in the last, couple, the last few films, and how do, what is the the difference for you? This is something that a lot of people have spoken of many t um, often, but for you personally, the difference between working in film and working digitally. Uh, we have to face it that, that in the last few years, <coughs> the industry of cinema changed drastically, almost completely in, uh, in the use of digital. And uh, it's something that uh, when we met with Woody two years ago, he, um, he called me for Café Society. Uh, we spoke about uh, Woody, what you always use a film. Me too, even if I done several experiments, uh, uh, several tests with the electronic cinema, particularly with Francis Coppola, uh, also in Italy with Giuliano Montaldo. Um, but let's face it, progress is a word that we can uh, speed up or slow down. But we cannot stop it. In Italy, Technicolor shut down the whole laboratory. The Kodak doesn't exist any longer. There is no any office. Uh, in order to try to continue, even in my last film, but was three years before, Mohammed that I done in, in Iran for two years, and, uh, and um, I chose film because it was the only element the mechanically also the cameras on that was give me the guarantee in that kind of environment. Later I didn't do any other movie uh, like I did after Apocalypse Now because I think once in a while we need to stop and we need to come back to be more innocent, more student, to escape of our own roots let's say. Uh, till uh, um, any project that they proposed me, I didn't feel it. I, I accepted only the one with Woody because uh, I thought that there were elements that I can perform. Originally, when I asked to, have, uh, to read the script, uh, they said to Vittorio, but you don't uh, ask to Woody Allen to read the script. At least they, I have to, because I, otherwise I don't know what to do. Otherwise I don't know if I'm appropriate to do that movie. Because if I don't know if I can give an, an, a support and specific uh, uh, personality in cinematography, why am I going to do the movie? For salary? Thanks God, at this moment, uh, maybe I don't need any longer. I never done when I was uh, at the beginning. Why I should put was over there? Woody was very nice, fantastic. He sent me the script. I said, Vittorio, if you don't feel in the mood, uh, don't worry. We are young enough that we can do another movie, but the script was beautiful. <laughs> The script was beautiful, a plenty of elements to do it. Uh, we discussed the story and we dis decided to enter in a digital world together. And I have to say that from uh, the beginning, we found ourselves very comfortable. Uh, he told me right away, even if uh, we told you before, I was not even looking at the monitor. Now you present me a perfect image on the set. Uh, very close to where the one will be the, the final image over there. And I, and I feel even more comfortable to 
follow the actor, follow the story, follow the, and I saw even the image in the way they're supposed to be. Uh, so I didn't change my directing, and I never changed my lighting, believe me. Of course I select the camera that was close to my personality, that think that was appropriate in the kind of uh, level of, of uh, performance, uh, in uh, quality and color shade, uh, also particularly because I have a sense of very close to the one that, uh, that I love uh, since more than almost 20 years. I stopped to do uh, any film in anamorphic, uh, in, in, uh, in panoramic, uh, in whatever format is. Uh, I'm tired to numbers. 1375, 1266, the panoramic in French, 185 in England, America, 2121, the 65, 1235, the anamorphic. What was this kind of number? Leonardo da Vinci, when he did this image, he was 20 years old. The Annunciation practically divided the world in two, humanity and divinity, <coughs> to exactly square the eyes, and he practically made his idea that was completely confirmed when he did the Last Supper. Last Supper is probably the poster of the Renaissance, the search for equilibrium. He was so uh, strong in this concept. There was one century before Galileo Galilei or Copernico to say that there's no question of the earth turning around the sun or the sun turning around the, the, the earth if they're part of the universe or, or infinite number of universe like uh, the, philo the philosopher uh, usually said, like Giordano Bruno, he put the human being in the center of the universe. He put the Jesus made man. And there is a fantastic story. The, the discussion they did with Luca Pacioli. Luca Pacioli was a mathematic, uh, great, great uh, for geometry, but uh, all the drawing was done by Leonardo da Vinci on his book. He take a nail uh, in uh, Santa Maria delle Grazie in Milano. He put the nail in one prayer. Pause took the, the nail and made all the line for all the uh, proportion, a, a line of, of a fuga that was supposed to be there. It was right here, the center of the mind of Jesus. When I saw this painting, I was shocked about the equilibrium that I saw. And I said, well, but this, why we don't film it in this way? Can I know the expect ratio? Two to one. And from that moment on, I never use any other system. So for me, digital, this kind of war between digital film is, is, doesn't make sense. Because we, uh, human beings since ever had the feeling and the need to perform uh, in visual art. Since uh, when we do the graffiti into the cave, we use the little mosaic for the making a, a, mos a mosaic. We use the little stone. Uh, we, um, Leonardo was painting in wood. The, the Annunciation. He painted in canvas, in, uh, like Caravaggio. We painted in, 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 in photography the black and white emulsion, color emulsion, in panoramic, in 3D, in digital. What is the difference? The matter is different. Not the energy, not the idea, not the concept. To me, the main problem there is today, the fact that the, the digital camera is so sensitive uh, that you can record an image everywhere you go. But that kind of available light is correct for that sequence, for that story, for that emotion. Sometimes can be. Sometimes it can be part of, sometimes no. The most important thing is that concept, that we shouldn't lose what we learn from the great history master the rhythm of movement of Giuseppe Verdi, of Mozart, the literature of Dostoevsky, of Faulkner, or Pavese, the painting of Caravaggio and so on, the cinematographer that were before us. And we keep this history with us and try to convey our personal emotion and try to transfer all the kind of element that is back in our history in the new form with the, with the new element, which is yourself. Because there is no doubt. In any art, 
my granddaughter teach me because I didn't study classic art means ability in any ability in any art wherever is the work in a costume in 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 in, in, in directing in, in cleaning this floor in lighting we we put in ourselves if we love what we're doing why because we are trying to understand who we are if it's possible that we can make it at which level we can arrive at we can practically day by day if you are able to yesterday was a difficult sequence for me something they for many days I was thinking how I can realize it. I have an idea, but I don't know if it was able to materialize it. A step by step, I, they, they said they can be realized. I felt that I was giving answer to my own questions. I was able to understand the meaning of my life. That's what counts. Not that there is digital number or, or photochemical. This is it's part of our history. Fantastic. Everybody can be free to use whatever they want. Cinema is a great word. If there is any kind of filmmaker that we can have, that's fantastic. Just do with love, with dreams, and with liberation what the surrealists did. And you will be happy in any kind of form. I respect everybody, even if I know they will never go back to do a black and white movie because I need those other seven tonality of color that Isaac Newton told me to perform. Otherwise, I feel that I miss something. I will never can do another panoramic 185 or 166. Bertolucci loved the, in, 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 uh, the conformist French cinema, and we did the conformist in 166. And I was going all around every theater in Rome I changed the, the, the gate because Gianluigi Tintignan was cut over here or cut over here. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Every, particularly in the United States, any movie that was done uh, before the, uh, the, the digital era, anamorphic or, or, or panoramic sound, they were cut to fill the screen in television. So practically, there was no any respect for the art form. Cinema, is a language of images. If you alter it in the image, we alter it in the, the concept of the film itself because you have a different emotion from an image. So to me, I love to be what is today uh, the element can, they can I use. I have a great camera, a great uh, person, gentleman, they help me assist them, camera operate everybody that uh, I can use. I see the image, I conscious. I remember that when I did the test for Sony in 1983, and for the first time I saw an image in high definition while we were shooting. And I said, oh my God, this is it, what I'm doing. For the first time in my life, I went back home to the hotel where my wife and my children were waiting for me, and I was serene. I was not with the question mark <laughs> to any, in Apocalypse Now, we were waiting for two weeks to see dailies. They were weekly, or monthly almost. <laughs> <laughs> I was quiet because the, I have a good uh, relationship with the technical in Rome, because that's why we chose to go over there, because uh, the, the, the color timer was in Rome. He was sending me telegram at that time every day. I knew what I was doing, and I, I feel comfortable. But uh, today, that kind of innocence, that kind of mystery, maybe we don't need any longer. We need consciousness. We need to know what we're doing. Because if we know what we're doing, first of all, we feel that uh, it's something appropriate for us or not. If we know the elements in the way it's formed the image, we are even able to change, to modify, to make a better or appropriate uh, according to the story, uh, any single image of the, of the moment. And after, when we're done, we've done it. Digital Intermediate is not made, not for made the look of the movie, to refine something, to adjust to little things. But the main work has to be done in the set. Don't believe when somebody says, don't worry about we fixing post. 
that's terrible. The worst element that you can do. I, um, that you can do it. Leave that moment. Hey, believe me, I, I don't cry when I finish one movie, like I did my first movie. But I have the same emotion any movie that I start. Because for how much we are preparing, for how much we study, for how much we do research, for how much we today have the luxury to do a long period of pre-production. I know very well when I arrive at full shooting, there is always the unknown. We know when we open the first door, but along the journey we have to be ready to catch that moment that there may be one actor, one performance, one new idea of the director, one new your idea. The you can keep your principal concept alive, but you should be able to adjust whatever this moment. And you can do if you see an image. If you have to know how you can modify that image if it doesn't work. So I don't have any problem. In fact, we are today, we have on the set an HDR monitor. I dynamic range is something that uh, not only Amazon, but many companies pushing in order to give stronger emotion to young audience, uh, started to mainly for a special effect uh, picture or, or great uh, venture picture. But if you not care about the element of vision, you can use it appropriate. We do in the, 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 the HDR version since uh, Café Societe, and we did already in, in uh, um, Wonder, Wonder Wheel. Now, Simone D'Arcangelo, the DIT, and Anthony Raffaele from uh, Technical Post Work from Vittorio, why we don't start from the beginning? Don't, don't wait after the, the digital intermediate to see the image the, we have in HDR. You should see from the beginning on the set. And that's what I'm doing. But you need love. You need dreams. And you need uh, inspiration. 100%. Ed, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I... Well, I partly agree and disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree that we use light, space, and time to create our images from our heart and from our mind. But if I look at painting movements like pointillism, impressionism, German expressionism, even modernism, they all use different tools to create those images. And I just don't want to limit the tool for me, the digital media is a different look and feel than the film media. And not all films, I feel, should be represented by the digital media. And I could explain technically why I feel that way. They can talk about 14-stop range, exposure range. They can talk about, but the color separation is different. The way uh, the chemistry of RGB, the three layers, it's, to me, it's like an etching in the, in the chemical process of the development. And so for me, I, there are certain films that I think should be photograph, photographically, chemically. And it's not because it's that I can see it on the set. It's because it's going to, in the, even though it goes to a DI, a digital, and it's going to be projected digitally, I can tell there's a difference in the feeling of the film. But I'm an old guy, and so, you know, I still i am trying to hold on the photographic process. But I, I'm, I, certain films, I think, are... I, I look at, actually, like almost the digital media is like photorealism, you know, if I had to compare it to the... I just don't want to limit our paintbrushes to tell our stories. But on the <laughs> but one thing I'm sure that you that you do both agree on is what Vittoria was saying about the fact that the technology doesn't determine it's it's when right. you see the fact that you have to see the image and the idea of like oh we'll fix it in post and of you know the, the tools don't make the movie. Uh, 
know, you should do it as much in the camera as humanly possible because that shows you how to point of view of why and how you were telling the story. If you do it after the fact, that means you didn't have the idea to begin with and it won't be as strong. It is, th though, with, with digital, it becomes easier, for instance, a lot of film films that are made on lower budgets paint out microphones. That, that's no longer a headache. You know, yeah. That's something that um, <laughs> used, to be a, used to be a great big headache. Um, why don't we uh, look at the clips from Wonderstruck, and Wonderstruck was shot on 35, no? Yep. On 35 black and white negative that Kodak uh, graciously made for me and then one lab in uh, Los Angeles processed it, and the rest was uh, shot in color. So the two different scenes, one in color, one in black and white. Okay. And Kodak made the black and white stock for you? They had it in their catalog and they made it for me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't make much black and white stock anymore, no. Yeah. Um, it's a, a real gift also to be able to have a face like that to photograph Millie, yeah. Millie Simmons. I mean, that's... She uh, is actually an uh, actual deaf girl and they found her in Utah. Yeah. She had never acted before. That's incredible. Um, so do, would you like to just go directly into the clip from Wonder Wheel? Okay, let's do that. As you can see, the duality is one single sequence that already been symbolized about this film. Honestly, when I read the script uh, that Woody sent me, uh, at the beginning it was, uh, I, I understood that the was not so easy for me to find the proper path, the visual path to follow the story, like it was immediately with Café Society. It was much more deeper. Uh, well, the, what touched me at, uh, right away was the fact that uh, we have a story that starts like uh, a comedy with the wonderful life of people at the beginning, a step by step the progressing more and more going deeper uh, more and more become more according to a drama between uh, different uh, personality of the different family. So I remember there was some uh, image that stayed in my mind with uh, a great painter, Norman Rockwell. The 1950, soon after the war, he was uh, doing an image that was presenting a surface of living in the United States, particularly in the small city. Beautiful, perfect, uh, the way the family, the apartment, uh, the office, everything was neat, was clean, was uh, well lit, was very well designed, was very well. And, uh, and I said, well, this can be maybe uh, an interesting approach at the beginning. And maybe something so uh, superficially beautiful, but step by step the progress in the story go into more a dramatic, a uh, so more hard, a more conflict way. So I came in New York with this idea, but I knew that was just the beginning. I was not uh, absolutely ready to really start this movie. Uh, I, once again, uh, I said that the cinema is uh, not a single art, is uh, is a multiple art. So I said directly, Woody, I need your help. And I need the help of Santo, the production designer. I need the help of, of Susie, the costume designer, to try to together see between uh, uh, the process of uh, developing the project, the kind of idea that came, up, came to us. Would he like the idea originally, uh, the, the first idea that the, the, visual, visual, the visualization of the picture can uh, progress in that way from something very light, uh, soft, uh, in the beginning through face, go deeper, deeper, deeper into the, the um, progression in, in, in um, drama. Just the day after, with uh, the co-producer, Ellen Robin, with the assistant director, uh, Daniel Rigby, with uh, Santo Loquasto, uh, 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 um, the location, uh, um, 
We went to, to see the first location where this movie is supposed to be set. I knew the name of Coney Island, but my ignorance didn't know what Coney Island was. I thought it was a, a suburban New York, little, uh, little city and so on. So when I discovered there was the little town next to the ocean with a beautiful beach where everybody was going to have a, a nice time, and not only that, but the city itself is an amusement park. I was shocked. I realized that uh, practically there was an incredible duality again, even stronger. The fantasy world outside and the real world inside. In fact, between Woody and Santa, they decided to uh, have the apartment of this family exactly in the middle of Coney Island. So yeah. any window around, uh, you can have the roller coaster, the wonder wheel, the parachute flare, whatever. The fantasy, whatever it can be, the divertiment, the good time, having a good time outside. But everything is happening to the family was the duel between the mother and the son, the father and the daughter, the wife and the, and the husband, the son, like in real life, they can happen like that. And that added to me another major step in front. The visually also I can use the, any uh, change, any element between uh, not only the, the, the music, the rhythm, but the color and light from the amusement park, they can be part of their own life. That's, I think, it was fantastic. But I was not quite happy yet. I knew that that was a very surface idea. But it was, I need something more central. And uh, the more I was reading the script, the more I understood that the, there were two principal subjects, uh, Ginny and Carolina, Kate Winslet and Juno Temple. They practically had to have two completely different personalities fighting for the love of the, the lifeguard, Justin Timberlake. And I said, oh my God, but this is a perfect duel that we have to develop. Practically one, Jeannie is somebody that uh, uh, she's not very happy the life that he's doing. She would love to do something that she never really completed in her past, in her, to be an actress. So probably she's still acting, uh, even doing her own work. She's connected with her own past. And the other one, having a, mm, a very uh, difficult uh, beginning of this life, now change to try to change, try to be uh, looking into the future of their her life. So try to live another <coughs> moment, completely different. Uh, one way to another, in the way the script was following the character, um, leaving into the uh, working into this bar, they stop a sunset. So I was able to use very natural element, uh, the sun setting with his own color, the warm color connected with the personality of Ginny. And maybe when uh, Caroline was going to school to progress in her knowledge uh, that she was going at the end of the day, in the evening, we, I can use the moon uh, relationship. So. One is connected with the warm color, the other one with the cool color. The physiology of color theory came to my mind. It's something that uh, Hippocrates, after the early study in Egypt, really the, the, um, the father of the medicine in Greece, developed the behavior of the human body in relation to the event, in relation to natural element, like the earth, fire, water, and, and, and air, relation to the, uh, even the wind, the different wind, relation to different light. During daytime, uh, practically we're receiving uh, the, the uh, kind of butt of, of energy, of visible energy, the light on our body, and we're receiving another completely different butt on the, in the evening when the last light of the blue uh, sky is over us. Practically, scientifically proved, we change our metabolism, we change our blood pressure according to the frequency, the each of the color, the seven color that is at Newton individual into the white light, uh, that's specifically why we call each one in a different name, and according to this kind of vibration that we're receiving, we change our emotion. We don't see light 
visible energy just by eyes, but with the entire body. We are like a photographic uh, uh, film. And I thought that this can be fantastic, the fact that uh, following the personality of, of one lady or the other lady, um, particularly filmed uh, um, um, uh, a sunset or a magic hour, I can really underline the personality of them. And that's give me the central idea of the concept. I have to say, thanks to the collaboration, after we spoke with Susie and uh, Santo, <coughs> we practically together uh, focalized the idea. A, a Woody was perfectly in sync with us. You know, before I met Woody, uh, everybody was telling me, mm, better that you don't do Woody, Woody movie. I say, why? Well, because he loved only one ton. Uh, and uh, he's watch, watching his movie, maybe he's in love with some kind of tonality, with some romanticism of the film that was done uh, uh, in the 50s, 60s, black and white, or monochromatic, uh, the, the, the kind of tone of the karyotype that reminds them the fact that they can be classic art. If it has those kind of elements, and uh, probably it's not used to, to your strong uh, uh, visualization in, in a primary color. And I say, well, he's an intelligent man. If I think uh, that I'm proposing an appropriate uh, theory or an appropriate uh, concept, uh, uh, I'm sure that he will understand. A, a Woody was perfect. He understood from the beginning to the end. Anything uh, that, was, uh, the, that I proposed, he uh, understood the, uh, the story I, I like now because it's appropriate for the story. It's not just because it's different color. It's not just because it's a different contrast or different things. My give me the underline is exactly the story. And once again, I want to say that film is made by the, the uh, in, in community to the entire crew, from, from anyone. No doubt that uh, I cannot perform a festival without a story, a second without the director. My, but may, may, may my main collaboration, like with Arnold in a, uh, the, uh, leading the, into the perfect frame of two to one, uh, the composition of the rhythm of the image, the kind of uh, uh, journey that Simone let me do it between uh, crossing the bridge between photochemica and digital. I was not prepared originally because all my studies were done in different way. And Anthony Raffaele, the Pontecnicolo post work, uh, they give me the chance to be connected with his mind from the beginning. From the first day that we met, I may, and I explained to him my ideation through the entire uh, pre-production, production, and post-production, not only a digital intermediate. The movie doesn't start a digital intermediate, in my opinion. The movie should be progressed from that moment. Uh, once again, I tell him that uh, the, the people they particularly love, and love to be together in making a film, doesn't matter if it's recorded with a film or with a sensor. In my opinion, both of them are so sensitive that they can feel, that they can record the emotion of the crew. If the crew is in good faith, if the crew is in harmony, we have a great chance that the movie is a good movie, no doubt. Uh, once we believe uh, the everything we do is something personally that we uh, grow up day by day. We, working is not a duty. It's also a pleasure. It's also a chance that we have uh, to prove it ourselves. Of course we cannot do everything, but what we select what to do, I'm so happy, so happy, so happy you cannot believe on the fact that I realizing step by step, particularly in recent time, the meaning of my life. The fact that I realize in, in, in all the day or night, um, dream or nightmare, whatever it was, uh, that I understand who I am. I'm searching for an equilibrium between two different things. Light and shadows, man and woman, uh, in conscious and unconscious, day and night, woman and man, whatever. I try to find an equilibrium to find uh, who I am. That's why Buddhists say 
the money with this kind of movement, putting together opposite element. And I'm very happy to understand myself, thanks to making films. Thank you very much. Um, before we wrap it up, I, I think I, I'd just like to ask Ed if you wanted to, there's something that Vittorio said that is an opinion that I'm sure that you share, which is the fact that the crew, if the crew is not working together happily, um, something is not right, but if they are, you have a chance of having a really good movie. Um, well, the, the crew's my family. I right. have worked with some of the same crew for 30 years, and uh, in a way, we have to be the psychiatrist on the set. We have to be the confidant to the director, and s some people say it's a marriage. I like to think of it more like a dance partner, that you hear the same music, are you in the same step? Do you have the same rhythm? And the, the work that I do that's the best is when someone like Todd challenges me because he forces me into situations I wouldn't normally put myself in, but out of that I have to come up with creative solutions. And so I have a very open set in the sense of we're all familiar with each other and I'll, I'll take anybody's idea if it's instrumental in solving the problem of what we're creating. And I do a lot of research in the beginning. You know, we do these lookbooks, you know, that deals with the demographics, the history, the, the art of the time, the cinematic language of the time. And out of that, I find the emotional connection to the storyline. And that's what I'm looking for. And what, what Victoria is talking about is so true. It's about the subjectivity that we all inhabit in our images. And so the experience that we go through in our own life affects what the images are. And it also affects, it's very important on the set that we all have that same rhythm with each other. Well, I can't tell you what a, an honor it is and a pleasure it's been to be up here on this stage with both of you and to listen to you. and. Uh, it's a rare thing for everybody to have heard this exchange between two real masters of their art form. Thank you, Vittorio. Thank you, Ed. Thanks.